All right, Brother Knox, there we are. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word. The book of Samuel. We begin this evening with chapter 25, verse 1. But first, let's lay a little groundwork and we ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Most every chapter of this book of Samuel has a personal lesson that you can gain from it. A demonstration by divine intervention whereby you know your Father cares and that it is direct advice from Him. That's what's very important to you. I want to lay the groundwork to let you know exactly what that lesson will be tonight and it will be for you that are a little quick-tempered especially those that God has anointed, those that God has called, that happen to be a little quick-tempered. How to control that temper. How to react to that temper. Kind of a long chapter, but that's the subject, that's the base. And with that thought in mind, and if you have that problem, certainly let this be of an interest to you. Chapter 25, verse 1. And Samuel died. And all the Israelites were uh, gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. Ramah, of course, meaning hill. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now, let's tear that down just a little bit, if we may. It didn't mean he was buried in the actual house he lived in, but on the grounds in a tomb. It was customary, but I would draw attention specifically to the fact that all of Israel came to the putting away, if you would, of this Samuel, showing their love for him. Never before, no, I'm not going to say never before because that, that's not a true statement, but certainly since the problems have started in as much as he was, Samuel was the last judge, Saul the first king, and how quickly the children of Israel drifted away from God under their own king. They, God was not sought by the leadership in, in the way that it should have been, though God's divine intervention has been with them yet from the beginning. But it shows the love and the tenderness that the people felt toward this one Samuel. A child that the very mother dedicated to God's service even before his conception. And we see a passing then. The last judge passes on, and that first king who has turned into a person demonic possessed of many times, and yet then possessed of the Holy Spirit, whereby his common sense returns. I'm not going to say that the Holy Spirit had entered him, but that certainly the evil spirit had been driven out. When the true spirit is not inserted, certainly the evil spirit will come back, as will be the case with Saul. So, David attending this, yes, even, I wonder if Saul was there. Probably so. And perhaps things put to one side and the events and the lectures. And the only reason this is inserted here, this is the time in chronology, chronologically speaking, that it did take place. Verse 2. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. Carmel itself means park or plentiful. And the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing, shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, I want you to picture this at sheep shearing when the shears were there there were usually uh, celebrations parties after the hard working day a uh, sort of festival atmosphere and uh, much food and so forth and that's what brings about the request that David's about to make verse 3 now the name of the man was Nabal it's important that you know what Nabal means it simply means fool in the Hebrew tongue. Foolish or a little stronger, fool, because he was a fool. And the name of his wife, Abigail. Abigail in the Hebrew tongue meaning father of supply or uh, source or of joy. 
And certainly this little lady, with her wisdom and common sense, her ability to manage, I have no doubt that she managed uh, Mabel because he certainly couldn't. People would not have, I, I feel that this Abigail was the reason that servants were even kind to Mabel, that she was always there to intercede, a good woman. And she was a woman of good understanding. She had a lot of common sense, you got it? She could discern. And of a beautiful countenance, she was beautiful to look upon. But the man was curlish. Just, he, was, um, he was cruel and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. Not necessarily the Caleb that you might be thinking of, but that was just that this is the, the way it stands. Now, what does David have to do with this family? Verse 4, verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. Again, this meant that it was a time of celebrating, and um, it was kind of the bounty of the harvest, so to speak, uh, five. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get ye up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. In other words, let, let um, in my name, in the name of peace. Uh, six, and thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, he that has plenty, peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house. And peace be unto all that thou hast. This was the salutation. Verse 7. And now I have heard that thou hast cheers. In other words, this, this has, to, the, the, uh, has to do with the date, the event, the festivities that go with it. Now thy shepherds, which were with us. Aha, you got it? With us. We hurt them not. Neither... Was that there aught missing unto them? All the while they were in Carmel. In other words, uh, Nabal shepherds, a great many of them, uh, then there were Bedouin bands that would rob them, kill them, and so forth. And David protected his sheep all through that period. Did not take one thread of wool nor anything else from those shepherds protected them. Eight, ask thy young men, and they will show thee, they'll witness this for me, wherefore let the young men find favor in thine eyes, that's to say those ten he sent, for we come in a good day, this is festival day, we come, give I pray thee whatsoever cometh to thine hand, unto thy servants, and to thy son David. Now. I want you to remember that David, while he's on the move and on the run, and he's got 600 with him, that to be a quartermaster for a group like that or nothing would be quite a responsibility. That food would be very scarce, that it would always be a concern to David, and I have no doubt that he was, uh, he was very concerned about keeping supplies, and this seemed a good idea. After all, if they had been their protectors, and the saving of the sheep for Nabal, certainly he owed them something. Nine, and when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. They, they um, uh, rested or um, waited, if you would, for his answer. Now, the reason I'm laying this groundwork is I want you to see how David must have felt concerning this. He had really, they'd really gone out of their way in befriending the shepherds of this man and, um, and felt good about it. Now picture yourself in that sense because David's going to lose his temper and could almost commit a very bad act that he would pay for and regret. But God wants to show you how to deal with a quick temper. Verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servants, and he said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants now a, a days 
that break away every man from his master. In other words, there's a lot of servants run away. This proving he knew who David was, for he was implying on and playing on the words that David was Saul's servant, and he had ran away. Well, it wasn't that he had ran away, he was chased away. Either that or his life. So he's, he's really playing the part of Nabal, or the, uh, playing the part of a fool. He's stingy, he's tight, he's wicked, and he's showing that. He's showing that he is a genuine, out-and-out -out fool. Verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water? I feel it should be translated wine instead of water. My wine and my flesh that I have killed for my shares? That is to say, this feast, this festival we've got born, I've slaughtered fresh lamb, fresh meat, and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? You think I'm about to do that? Verse 12. So David's young men turned their way. It didn't, it didn't take long till he, he'd cut them down right real good. They turned their way and they went again and came and told, David, told him, all those things told David about it. Now bear in mind, here David has really gone out of his way and his men have gone out of their way to take care of this man's prop this man's property all the winter long. And this clown acts on this man. How did you feel? If you had men that were hungry, and after protecting this man's goods under God's own law, it was their right to have been able to share at least in the feast. That would have been the least they could have done. Well, David blows his stack. I'm going to tell you that right now. The, the English doesn't really draw forth the wrath that was in David. He's supposed to be a king and a leader, and a leader and a king can't blow their cool to the point that they would be excessive in retribution. Uh, I want to say that again. I didn't say that you had to be a second-class citizen and lay down and take everything that comes along. But at the same time, you cannot cause a bloodbath. By that I mean actual slaughter of men. Because somebody is a fool. But God does not approve of excess in revenge. He thinks that revenge belongs to him, and you'll find that the lesson in this chapter is exactly that. Verse 13. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men. They weren't messing around. They wanted blood. David wanted blood. And 200 abode by the stuff, that's to say their baggage, their traveling, the things they carried with them, 14. But one of the young men that was there when old Nabal dressed uh, down and blew his cork at David's ten men, there was one young man there that told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold! David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, wishing well. And he riled on them. That's to say he flew or he stormed at them. Verse 15. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything. They didn't take a thing from us as long as we were conservant with them conversant rather with them when we were in the fields they took care of us they brought us no hurt and they brought us no shame they didn't bully them they didn't lord it over them they simply protected them from the Bedouins and, and um, robbers and so forth 16 they were a wall unto us both by night and day they shielded us they protected us all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. 17. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. 
He said, I know the way he flew off at them, the way he stormed at them, as good as they were to us, you can get set. We're going to catch it. For he is a son, speaking of Nabal, just to show you that Abigail's own people knew what type of man he was, says, for he is a son of Belial, that a man cannot speak to him. His own servants couldn't speak to him, therefore that's why this one would come to Abigail. Bilal in this sense means a son of wickedness or a son of Satan. His own servants calling him back to his own wife, and she knew it. That's why it's very obvious that this good woman kept this entire assembly, the household of Nabal, together. What a woman. Eighteen. And then Abigail made haste. She didn't waste time. She made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn, that's to say parched grain prop properly translated, and 100 clusters or lumps of raisins, that's a lot of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. She didn't have to think about it. That's why you can rest assured who really managed this operation, that it was so successful and Nabal was prosperous. It was because Abigail was the boss as far as managing servants. 19. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. She didn't squeak a word of it to him. Verse 20. And it's a good thing she didn't, because if Nabal had resisted, David was after blood. He was angry. This was a dastardly, wicked, son of Satan thing to do, is to refuse them a little land when they had really put themselves out for them. Verse 20, And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. In other words, she met them where? She met them at the bottom of the ravine. She was, she was on this side of the ravine, they on the other, and they met there at the bottom. 21. I want you to listen to the wisdom of a woman. And David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness. In vain did we spend our time helping those people all winter, so that nothing was missing or missed of all that pertained unto him. And he hath requited me evil for good. He's insulted me. I'm going to cut his head off. Now, those are my words, but you can rest assured David was hot. His temper had boiled. 22. So the more also do God unto the enemies of David. God would do the same thing. Well, he wouldn't. He would have taken some revenge, but he wouldn't have made it a bloodbath, all right? If I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that be of a male, that's what this figure of speech means. It means he will not have a male left among him. 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass. She didn't waste time. She was talking. Listen to the wisdom. You'll see why that she was gifted in understanding, as it was reported back in verse 3. And fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground, paying homage. 24. And fell at his feet and said, Unto me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. In other words, she's taking the entire guilt, hoping to pull his mind off that fool, Nabal, and with the gifts, and of doing that that was right and that that was deserved, that it would cool this hot temper that was spewing forth from David and 400 armed men, which would have wiped out their camp. 25. 
Let not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial. She called her, I mean, that's, she called her own husband a son of Satan. Even Nabal, even the fool, you see, that it's really, that's what Nabal means in the Hebrew tongue. It's, uh, it's a descriptive noun, if you want to know the truth about it. It's probably not his real name, but a, a, a name given to him because of his condition. Uh, even Nabal, even the fool, for as his name is, so is he. Fool is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thy handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. I didn't see them. She was, after all, can't you see by now, the boss, the one that held the camp together, the one that would intercede, one that always saved her own male children, or, or the males of, of the family, 26. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and this Lord is Yahweh, all right? And as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, better translated to wade in a bloodbath, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Let them all be as fools. She's really kind of coming down on him, okay? She's pointing out here that if you were to look at that in a little different way, she's kind of called David to task that just because her husband's a fool, he doesn't want to be one as well. Because for that blood, as he was thinking, not even leaving one male killing the entire family off would be overdoing it. It would be a temper tantrum. 27. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. See how cool she is? She didn't say that gives you. She's saying given to these handmen. Why? I think she knew David worried about feeding his troops more than he probably worried about himself. 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. There she takes the blame for it again. Isn't that something? I suppose she was used to it. As long as she had been with Nabal, as long as she had been with the fool. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house this is prophecy. Did it mean she had heard of David? Sure, I suppose. But also, she's a witness to it. Because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. It's true. David, there had been no evil up to this time, but can't you see how she's dressing him down a little bit? This would be evil, David. There's never been any evil here, and you've always fought the Lord's battle, but this isn't... This, uh, the Lord will take care of his own battle in this case, which has to do with vengeance. 29. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. She even knew that Saul was after his very soul. But this bounded bundle, how can I say this? It would be even as, as protected as you would bind a large sum of money in a wallet and protect it. And the souls of thine enemies, then shall he sling out. Who? God. As out of the middle of a sling, God will sling your enemy's souls out. And that's true. She knew it. She was a very wise person. David's getting an education here, all right, in how to control tempers. Verse 30. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. She knew it. 31 that this shall be no grief unto thee. In other words, you're going to be king. And this fact that you're going to wade in the blood of murder 
would not be to your credit. So it's not going to be, there will be no grief unto thee, nor offense of, of heart unto my Lord. Either that thou hast shed blood causeless, uh, causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself, but when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. Well spoken, the wisdom of this fine woman, Abigail, a very wise woman. You might say, well, but understand this. She was riding more or less unprotected. She had sent the men on ahead into 400 hot-headed, angry men led by a man that was more hot-headed than the rest. And she took charge. Now that, my dear friend, is a real woman of Israel. A real cool gal, I'll tell you for sure. My kind of people. 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He's cool. She's comedy. Which sent thee this day to meet me. I thank God for you, woman, that God sent you to meet me. In other words, he's thinking in his mind, oh, I almost had all this on my conscience. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood. That means to commit murder. To wade in it up to the horse's bridles, practically. And from avenging myself with mine own hand, God avenges his elect to this degree. Uh, again, he doesn't expect you to be a second-class citizen and not stand up for your rights. But there are certain things that you must be wise enough to let God himself avenge. Because God has said, touch not mine anointed. That goes even to this day. God will strike down anyone that speaks badly of or accomplishes a bad thing against those that God has chosen to bring forth his word to serve him, those that have ears to hear and eyes to see. They are God's own. And anyone that comes against them, you can rest assured, God will break them down. Yes, even today, I have witnessed it. Verse 34. For in very deed as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting me, except thou hadst hasted, if you hadn't just come in a big hurry and come to meet thee, me, surely there had not been left upon Nabal by the, by the uh, uh, morning light any that be male among him. Verse 35, So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hard hearkened to thy voice. I've listened to you, wise woman, and have accepted thy person. I appreciate you. That's what he's saying. You see what a little common sense can do at a time when heads run hot, when tempers flare. A little understanding. And most of all, staying in what? Staying within the bounds that God has set forth in his word that we should stay within. For this Abigail, this very wise woman, she reminds me of a great deal of, of the um, judge. Yes, the same office that Samuel had that was held by a woman, Deborah. There was a woman led Israel when no man would stand. I know this upsets male, some male preachers. I don't know if they're afraid or what, but it's true. There was a time when there wasn't a man that would lead Israel, and a woman did, and she did a great job. She was wiser than any of them. And God called her and used her. That great Deborah. This Abigail reminds me of her. In all that pressure, one woman against 400 men. 
400 men coming down one side of a draw and her by herself on the other. And she has her way when they get to the bottom of the valley. And peace is restored because of the love and the understanding and the wisdom of this woman of God. Verse 36, And Abigail came to Nabal. She went back to the fool. And behold, he held the feast in his house. This was the feast of the shears, or shares, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him. He was living it up, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more. She didn't say a word to him until the morning light. Listen carefully, dear one. It's 37. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, that mean Nabal when, when he sobered up, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became a stone. You know what that means? There was a little old clot left to hit his little old heart, and the rest of his body turned to stone, meaning he was paralyzed from head to toe. He had a stroke. God sent that stroke on him. Meaning what? This wicked son of Satan, that David would have shed the blood of innocent servants that had to work under such a son of Satan, a son of Belial. God killed the fool rather than innocent people. See, he's a lot better knowing who needs correcting. God killed the son of Belial. Or he's about to. He's going to do it in two sieges, two strokes, 38. And it came to pass about 10 days after. He lets him lay. God allows him to lay there and suffer for 10 days. And the Lord smote Nabal that he died. He gave him another stroke and he kicked the bucket. God takes care of those that mistreat his anointed. There's one thing you don't have to worry about is one of his anointed. Don't let people run over you. But if they do you harm, God will strike them down just as sure as the sun will come up tomorrow. You can count on it. God is not some force out in the never never world. He is a reality. He's our Father. And He loves His children that are loyal to Him. It is His promise, and you can count on it. So don't get all hot-headed and make a fool out of yourself taking vengeance upon some fool. Let God just destroy them. Won't you do that? If they need it. He'll give it to them. If they don't, then in your hot temper, you might destroy someone in excess. Leave it in God's hands. God's will be done. He loves those that love Him, that are in His service. All right. I hope that helps you understand. If you're one of those that, are, that tend to have a hot temper, as we Irish do sometimes, five minutes you can... Not, five minutes later, you're going to hate yourself more than anyone else because you have such a hot temper that you fly off. May this help you to control it, to trust your Father and love Him and know that He is very severe in correcting those that touch His anointed. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, please.